Do a couple of these words really resonate for you and your brand? Compassion, service, caring, nurturing. I could give you more, but if any of these feel really exciting to you and really true to you, there's a good chance you have the caregiver archetype, or at least it plays a role in your branding. It's so important to know your archetype because it shows up in your brand voice, the types of words you use and the way you say it, but even things like the colors that you choose for your brand. It can go into every piece of your brand message. So let's dive straight into today's episode all about the caregiver archetype. Welcome back to Emma Givens Content and Copy. I am the founder of the branded copywriting and content marketing boutique of the same name, Emma Givens Content and Copy, based in Toronto, Canada. Let's dive into today's episode on the caregiver. The caregiver archetype is empathetic, wants the best for others, and offers emotional, spiritual sometimes, and physical protection even, or care for their ideal audience. In this episode, you should be able to identify whether the caregiver archetype is dominant for you, and if so, how to practically use it in things like your colors, your brand voice, etc. By consciously being aware of this archetype and using it to its fullest advantage in your brand, you can build conscious connection with your ideal clients. Really, it gives you a huge opportunity to build trust, and all archetypes do, but I think it's especially true with the caregiver. There's a sense that you need to genuinely care about your audience for them to believe you, and when they believe that you genuinely care about them, they are very, very loyal and very faithful to you, and they have a lot of trust that you have their best interests at heart. It allows them to relax in the relationship with you, it allows you to grow as a business, and also, hopefully, be really satisfied because of the work you're doing too. Now we've talked about this in some of the other videos about archetypes on our channel. We've talked about the explorer and the creator recently, and if you're curious, you can definitely check out the links in the description to learn about them as well. But what we have made sure to say is that it doesn't need to be an obvious fit in the sense that yes, there are industries that tend to draw caregivers, but that doesn't mean that everyone in that industry is a caregiver dominant brand. And it also doesn't mean that you have to be in those industries to be a caregiver. The archetype that your brand embodies, particularly as a small business, but I personally believe that it's always the founder, no matter the size of the business, the archetype your brand embodies reflects you as the founder and which archetype is the strongest in you. So you might've chosen an industry that's not stereotypical, for the caregiver and you could still be a caregiver brand. And that has its benefits. You really stand out as unique in that industry because you have a very distinct voice and mission and way of going about your work compared to others. That said, I'll still give you a couple of industries that tend to attract caregivers. Those include healthcare, geriatric care, and not-for-profits in general. All right, let's dive in and talk about the colors that tend to come up for the caregiver. So we're talking about some soft neutrals. It could be gray, taupe, white, soft blacks that kind of lean into charcoal. It could be soft greens or blues or just to keep it simple, I guess, turquoise. And fonts tend to be fairly rounded. In general, there's a sense of softness over sharpness for most caregivers, which is very reflective of that kind of nurturing, caring archetype. Some core values might be generosity. I would say caregivers generally have this in common. It could be selflessness or self-sacrifice. I think that might lean you into an unhealthy expression of this archetype, which we're not really going to go into today, but know that there's a difference between a caregiver and a martyr. <laughs> so it could veer into the martyr world. But for some people, self-sacrifice or selflessness might feel like a good word. For more, I would say words like service, nurturing, Interestingly, I think you can go with family or community, or perhaps both. That depends somewhat on the target audience, but it also depends on the word that feels safe for your audience as well. I think the caregiver's greatest driving desires are really interesting because I actually think in some ways they fly in the face of the selflessness idea. And I think it's okay. You know, we need to feel satisfied in our giving and our generosity to keep doing it, to feel fulfilled ourselves, to feel like it's filling up our cup at the same time. So while some caregivers might think of themselves as selfless or self-sacrificing, ultimately caregivers tend to have in common that they want to be recognized or appreciated. They want to feel meaningful and important to others. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think we want to feel like we matter and like the effort we're putting into helping people is making a difference. I don't think it's a selfish motivation. I think it's a realistic motivation, a human motivation personally. 
And I think it also makes a lot of sense because <laughs> caregivers that overgive or people who step into the kind of martyr archetype, the, the unhealthy version of the caregiver, if they don't feel appreciated, you can start to see resentment <laughs> that builds up and that's not healthy either. So you want to give freely and openly to prevent that, but you also want to make sure that you're giving to people who <laughs> are appreciating it or giving in a way that's helpful to them so they can appreciate it. I'm not the expert on this topic, but hopefully you understand what I mean by this. If you resonate with the caregiver, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the fact that this need to feel important or meaningful to others is a driving desire most caregivers have in common. Do you agree with that? And how does that show up in your life? Do you think it's a good thing? So many questions. Share with me your thoughts in the comments, please. The greatest driving fears are deeply connected. They include ingratitude, not being needed, and selfishness. A healthy caregiver makes their audience feel pretty amazing. They make them feel safe, understood, not alone, taken care of, loved. A simple common brand promise that caregivers have in common is ultimately to protect, to hold, and or to heal. Here are some strategies to connect with your ideal audience if you're a caregiver dominant brand. In order to grow and increase revenue, you actually need to put people ahead of the bottom line. Now, ultimately, I think that's the ethical thing to do in general, but I really mean in this case for caregivers that the more you focus on service and really good quality service for people and you have you know, a generally well-structured, well-priced business, absolutely, undeniably, the better your revenue will look like at the end of the year. This is ultimately true. I'd say for all businesses, but there's this sense of, okay, they genuinely care about me and they're providing impeccable service. This is something I hugely appreciate in this brand. And I'm going to be so, so, so loyal. I'm going to send referrals their way. Like this, this is public, this audience member is going to be incredibly loyal to your brand essentially. And it is going to have an impact on revenue because they don't feel like they're a dollar sign. They feel like they're human in a really profound way, often compared to other brands, perhaps other industries that caregivers don't gravitate towards. It's a really important piece to provide unparalleled service, of course, connected to that. But I think a cool way of thinking about it is that for the caregiver dominant brand, acts of service is their love language. This is also very connected to the two examples I just gave of a strategy for connection. But I think showing care for the person beyond the scope of your services or products, caring for them as a whole is really important to people who are investing in caregiver brands. What I mean by that is to really invest time, energy, money into their quality of life as a whole beyond their immediate customer experience. This might mean that you have a social impact initiative built into your business or a charitable arm, or you open your doors to community events if you have an in-person location. Maybe uh, the mayoral debate is held for free at your location. So that care and that community orientation really does extend beyond when they're paying. And I think that that is a really meaningful opportunity for caregiver brands and all brands in general, but it ultimately, again, helps caregiver brands really improve their revenue. So it's good for everybody. It's good for the community. It's good for the charity you're helping. It's good for the audience. It's good for you as a business owner. It's good for everybody. So I would describe this as the clincher for the caregiver. It's vital to act in accordance with your verbal commitments. So if you say you stand for something or you say you support this charity or this community, you must act with really tangible evidence of your actions in alignment. There is no room for performative activism among caregiver brands. There shouldn't be among any brands really, but caregiver brands cannot get away with it, or at least they can't get away with it for long. They must be perceived as genuine and they must focus on causes that are close to the hearts of their ideal clients or ideal customers. The greatest potential strengths of the caregiver, resilience or staying power, generosity, acting on compassionate impulses, building in a social impact or charity arm, using your platform to speak for the less or underrepresented or the voiceless, and practicing what you preach. These are all incredible personality traits if you can live in alignment with them, and they're wonderful traits for brands to have. This is really true more and more, I would say, because with generation or Gen Z that we're looking at that are becoming really powerful consumers, there's really good evidence that they will prioritize brands that share their values, that act in alignment with their values over brands that are just cheaper or more well-known. They really choose to work for 
and be loyal to as customers brands that act in alignment with their values. So the caregiver is really well positioned in this climate. All right, potential downfalls. The caregiver may be prone to looking for outside opinions when they make decisions. This might play a role, for example, at the management level, if you end up looking for consultant after consultant or coach after coach after coach or expert after expert, you see what I mean. It's really important to balance this by taking action for the adequate period of time on a consultant's plan after they've prescribed it to really see the results before you just automatically move on to another consultant. Really rely on your own expertise and experience as well as a business owner the more you develop it and value very highly input from your customers because ultimately at the end of the day, what they think matters the most. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but there is that unhealthy potential side to the caregiver, which is the martyr. That's the unhealthy expression of the caregiver. When you go too deep into self-sacrifice, it starts to build resentment, etc. The caregiver could be perceived as old fashioned in some way. There is also this sort of, I think in many ways, positive characteristic of kind of like a motherly figure or warmth associated with the caregiver. But depending on your audience and how you convey that message, it might feel overbearing, just like potentially a mother who's trying to do the best for her child or protect her child could, could come across as overbearing, depending on the language and the relationship that's been developed thus far. So you might wanna keep that in mind. Really evaluate where your relationship is right now with your audience and how to make sure it develops in a really healthy way where they come to you for that safety and warmth and your messaging feels super genuine without kind of projecting onto them. Projecting could be something like carrying over processes from a long time and being really resistant to the customer's input about the fact that it needs to change, being resistant to changing messaging so it better aligns with the current customer's language. In some ways, it's just being an older generation uh, compared to, you can imagine, like the children, the audience, which you don't normally want to think of them that way. But, you know, if you think about it as like an age gap, you might say, with well, my experience, my tradition tells me to continue this way. But if the youth are rebelling and saying, wait, no, I want something different, you've got to find a way to meet them halfway. Hopefully that example makes sense. There's also a little bit of vulnerability that you have as the caregiver because there's no room to stray from putting the customers first. So if you receive bad press, that suggests that you're putting the bottom line over your customers' needs, or cutting corners, or you know your salespeople are pushy, or anything like that, you can really alienate your customers and make them feel less trusting. And it can take quite a long time to build up that trust. So sometimes there are structural things you could do to prevent that. Like for example, maybe you don't have 100% commissioned salespeople on your team. If you have a sales team, maybe you can build it up so that there's not this immense pressure to make the sale at all costs, but that they can really, of course, there's always going to be people who you're going to have to deal with, um, especially if you have a really big sales force, you wanna make sure that there's checks along the way so you can catch people who might not care regardless. But ultimately you want to structure things so that way the customer can be put first, no matter kind of what tension a person might be put in. I think this is also true with employees or team members to make sure that their experience is also that they are cared for in a genuine way. So that when they talk about the brand that they've worked with before to potential customers or potential other employees, that they also have this really congruent they act the way they say they act kind of message that goes out on your behalf. Some brand storytelling techniques for the caregiver. Tell them that you care sparingly, show them that you care immensely. So it's that classic show, don't tell. It's also, you know, acting out your promises. I would say a lot of caregiver messaging is pretty straightforward in the sense that you meet them where they are in terms of their pain point or their dissatisfaction, and then you provide a solution to them you are the bridge to that solution. Sometimes it's a solution that only you can provide. This is quite traditional, you know, that pain point, desire kind of connection. In messaging, oftentimes this works for the caregiver because the caregiver generally is coming in to protect or to heal. So there usually is a really clear problem that your ideal client is facing. Since caregiver brands are very values focused and their customers are too, it's a really good idea to share an origin story if you have one that matches that of your ideal clients. You may not have an origin story that really does match, but if you do in the sense that you faced the same problem as them and you created your product as the solution to it, 
or the service you're offering is something that your mom needed at one point, you wanted to do it better than the company she went to at the time. You don't have to name the company, but just you're working to improve the experience for other people like you needed to for yourself or your loved ones. This can build a lot of trust. It shows that you're invested personally in the success of the product or service for the end client as well. I would share openly about any initiatives that your business takes for social causes, sharing about its charity initiatives or its community doors open events, all of these things because you're taking genuine action and instead of focusing on, you know, our brand is so great because we do this, if you make sure to tell the story from the perspective of our community got together, they were located at our building, you're really focusing on our community benefited this way, you benefited this way. It was an honor to host these people so that they could focus on this. So basically put the storytelling on the end audience or the community and really make your brand secondary, but very clearly in it, in the story, in the report, in the press release. So that way you still get the benefits of it, but that it comes across as genuinely, we did this because we cared. And hopefully it's the truth. Okay, so now let's talk about some examples of your archetype's influence on your brand voice. Your voice should sound considerate and warm, very family or community focused. You might use the word family a lot or community a lot. That could be it. But it might also be that you talk about other people like we gave in the last example under brand storytelling. You're really focused on using you even more maybe than some other brands. I always love using you. It shows that you care about your audience and that you're placing them first when sometimes they barely know you. So it's always a good best practice, but I would say you really wanna focus outward to community, to you, the audience, when you're a caregiver brand. Essentially, you need to come across in your voice as more collectivist than individualist. So for example, it might make sense for your brand to also use we a lot more than I. This might depend on how many people you have working in your business, but it could also be kind of the metaphorical we saying that you're part of a community, you might use we to talk about how our business is part of the community. Together, we, right? Instead of saying our business and this institution, try and really show that collectivism in your voice and the words that you use. Caregiver brands are also usually quite thoughtful. There's a real sense of reflection. You might tell stories. This is actually going back to brand storytelling, but it just occurred to me. You might tell stories that talk about a moment in the past. So you share that you're reflecting on a moment in the past. Generally, the language is quite inclusive. It's usually quite polite to make sure it's, you know, friendly to families or community. That often I think is part of why. And it's reassuring. Some key phrases that might sum up a lot of caregiver brands are, I care about you, I'm willing to sacrifice for the greater good, or it's an honor to serve. And finally, some example of caregiver brands and personalities. Johnson & Johnson, Campbell's like Campbell's Soup, Rachel Ray, Tom's like Tom's Shoes, Princess Diana, UNICEF, and World Wildlife Fund. So for fun or because you're genuinely sure at this point that you're the caregiver brand, I would consider looking at some of those examples, see how they spoke, see what their websites look like, what colors are they using, do they use we a lot, do they use you a lot? I would really study them a little bit, especially your favorite, and see, ah, oh, does this feel like me or a voice that my brand can start to play with a little bit? If you're not already, you might find that you're doing a lot of these things intuitively. That happens a lot with archetypes, but the more conscious you can be about it, the better the results are for your business. Your marketing lands better with your ideal clients and the results for your brand in terms of revenue, client loyalty, et cetera, reviews, really great testimonials. It all improves the more in line you are with your brand archetype on a conscious level. So let me know in the comments below if you feel you are definitely a caregiver brand, or if you're not quite sure and you have a clarifying question or two, be sure to ask me. I'll be very happy to help you out. If you're not totally on board with the caregiver, then make sure you check out one of our past episodes on some archetypes like the explorer and the creator. And we're going to continue the series to get through all 12 dominant archetypes. So you can definitely find the brand archetype that suits you best. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and make sure you've subscribed and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode, especially about the archetypes. Thank you so much for joining me today on YouTube for this latest episode of Emma Gibbons Content and Copy, and I will see you again very soon. Bye!